Welcome back to Shine 18. Really glad that you could be with us for um, one of our last sort of sec sessions, uh, last four sessions of the, the whole event. And to those who've been with us earlier on in the day, thank you so much for coming back and sticking, sticking with us today as we go through our 19 speakers from all around the world. We've got uh, coming up next for you a session from Beth Coleman. Now, Beth's an experienced knowledge management and service innovation professional with 30 years experience in service design. Um, her career, um, she has experience in IT service management um, beginning at Texas Instruments um, and moved from the US uh, to New Zealand to work um, with, uh, as, with business process and methodology design in telecoms. Uh, she's worked in financial services, tourism, uh, service innovation and, and now is doing KCS consulting, knowledge centred service consulting with Catalink Limited. Um, so uh, that involves working across organisations, assisting leaders in applying KCS concepts and principles and practices as a means to deliver customer value and achieve customer success. So we're really excited to have um, Beth with us today and her session, as I mentioned earlier, is called Knowledge, the Next Frontier for Service Management. Um, so we should have Beth on the line now. Are you there, Beth? If you can unmute your microphone, we should be able to hear you. Um, yes, I'm here now. He hello. Really Hi. Fun. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for joining us. Lovely to be here. Thank you. And I believe you're presenting today from California, although you um, live usually now in New Zealand. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I'm in Berkeley, California today at a work center shared space. So. It's great. Oh, fantastic. Okay, fantastic. Um, and yeah, we're, what we'll um, we'll go straight into your presentation, if that's okay. I'll just give you the presenter control. Um, and please, for everybody listening, do post your questions for Beth um, during her presentation. We will have time to come to those at the end, so don't forget to do that. Um, I'll remind you a little bit later on. But any time that you uh, a question pops into your head, just post it using your webinar uh, control panel, and we'll come to them at the end. So, Beth, I can see your screen. That all looks great. So I will let you carry on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. It's really a pleasure to be here. I've had the opportunity to listen to a few of the previous speakers. Uh, Kevin was talking from Sam Anage, uh, Kat, Kat Turner. I, I listened to Kat's information on mentoring. Uh, Zoe, it was great to get your help in setting this up. And I'm looking forward to hearing more. I also had a chance to speak, to, uh, listen to Barkley Ray, uh, um, and he was excellent with regard to how managers should mean move towards being more digital. And Erica Flora, fantastic presentation on her work in agile, and of course Jen, Jeff Romberg with the metrics. So I am I am very um, excited about all of the sharing that's been going on today. What I'm going to do is uh, try to introduce you to KCS, Knowledge Centered Service. If you haven't heard of KCS, it is a methodology. And as mentioned by Zoe, I've been working with knowledge for some time now. My background of though is in service design. Over the many years I've been working, I've been primarily working in education and service has been a key co component of that. But my IT background started with Texas Instruments, and at that time, they were actually leading in AI development, artificial intelligence, believe it or not. My journey to New Zealand took me to very distant regions, and one of the things I love doing is innovating. So I have a master's in business innovation and entrepreneurship, which I started, uh, I'm a lifetime learner, so I started only uh, 15 years ago. And I was excited to find that there are a body of of people in groups doing innovation, and one of those is the Consortium for Service Innovation. When I discovered the consortium, I was very interested in the work they were doing around service management and how they are defining and identifying how knowledge can assist with service management. So I investigated the academy, which is the KCS Academy that they've established, and that is a uh, course and training center which also provides consulting services. It is a, a, a profit-making organization which trains people to train and consult in Knowledge Center Service. So I've become certified in Knowledge Center Service through the KCS Academy. But I'm also very much a follower of the consortium. 
one of the things that uh, Jeff was talking about earlier is that it's very important to make comparisons to benchmark your organization against others. The consortium is designed to allow that to happen with its members. So all the members who are primarily involved in service innovation are constantly talking to each other and uh, establishing the benchmarks for how they can improve service. And part of that, of course, is to do with knowledge. There are other innovation work uh, activities that they're doing and projects they're working on. And you can find all of that on their um, website, which you'll see soon, but it is called serviceinnovation.org. Uh, I will also mention later what the KCS Academy website is, but at this stage, we're really talking about innovation and we're talking about knowledge, the new frontier. So why do I want to talk about it as a new frontier? I guess per perhaps it's because my experience with knowledge so far has been that many people are looking for opportunities around how they can use knowledge for their benefit in service management. And it is a new area in the sense that new technology is making it possible to do more with knowledge. So first I'll con confirm what I'm going to be doing in this presentation, but even before that, I'm just going to differentiate knowledge from the general knowledge, which you might get from going to the library and reading and then perhaps storing documents, et cetera, for your later use. We're talking about knowledge for service and that is specifically for serving customers. So our focus will be here today on talking about how knowledge can be used in the process of serving customers and also in the process of helping ourselves to ensure that we have a better and more engaged environment for allowing us to serve those customers. Um, so first of all, what I'll do is I'll take us to the next slide, which is hopefully happening. There we are, the agenda. Our main focus is first starting with service transformation and knowledge and what is the context that I'm referring to. Then we go to the driver, creating a single source of knowledge. And of course, the journey, establishing KCS practices. How do we get there? What do we do with KCS in order to create a single source of knowledge and also to assist us in performing better against customer experience, ensuring customers have a better journey along the path of either sales or service. And then also we're gonna be talking a little bit about a new area that is quite exciting called intelligence swarming. Intelligence swarming, again, is another area that is being discussed by the consortium and they are uh, constantly updating each other and producing information for the KCS Academy to introduce as part of their overall suite of services. The knowledge uh, of human interaction and machine in collaboration is the last section I will be talking about. And a few of you have already mentioned that previously. It's going to primarily focus around the drivers for doing this work and how knowledge can assist. So I'd like to start first with a bit of information about what NASA does. I like the NASA website. They have a knowledge services area which provides information to anyone visiting on what they are currently doing. And they are doing this through uh, a website portal which gives opportunity for people to learn about what NASA does and also to get a little understanding of the community. They call it the knowledge community and it is a long-standing community which does interact across the organization if you look through their website, you'll find lots of information on how they do that. The reason I like this site is because it does actually focus on their vision, the fact that they have a vision for the future and that they have a, a deep knowledge services area that they can consistently support and provide information updated based on their current knowledge. Um, the thing that really brings some organizations forward, and this is example, another example NASA does, is they bring together all of the information into one location for others to see. And they share it using a single source of truth, what they have all agreed to post or to provide through a process that they have set up themselves. So the focus on this particular section of our presentation is around how do we do that? How do we get to a single source of truth? So knowledge is vast in your organization. You may find knowledge in emails. You may find it in a uh, portal that stores documents, a platform that has information stored such as a wiki. 
you may have shared information in your documentation around, for instance, how you organize your, yourselves in an IT shop. You may have procedures and processes that are needed when you're handling a call. All of that sometimes can be found in one place, but for the most part, it's distributed quite a bit across the organization. Our focus here is talking about why would we want to go for a single source of truth? And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about a way of integrating knowledge bases so that people can access them more easily and find what they need quickly. If you have a central knowledge base, which may point to various locations in your organization, ideally people will find the information they need and can then use it quickly. So within service, we want to provide information that is ensuring that all of our current knowledge that we currently have across the team is updated naturally and through a way that is naturally focused around process that is done every day. So what we do in our daily activities is naturally updating our knowledge base. And getting to that is not easy. Sometimes it requires a little bit of analysis first on what knowledge we have, sometimes quite a bit. We also need to understand what knowledge is being used in order to serve the customer and where is it being used. So if you have a really large organization with complex and interest, interactions between different groups as well as the customer in various locations, it's important to understand what is going on when a customer searches or when a staff member searches, how quickly can they find what they need and where are those repositories held are they integrated? Can they be integrated? If not, how do we move forward with that? Is there knowledge that is no longer being used? How do we archive that? And should we delete it? Those are the kinds of questions that you might be asking when you're looking at your single source of truth for a central knowledge base. So the purpose of a central knowledge base is to ensure that we have the collection of experiences to date. So we want to know what people understand to be the most recent knowledge that we can use to serve the customer. Very often, we don't have that. We have captured it in our heads. We may be serving the customer with information we know is the answer, but it may have changed. So how do we ensure that we have the most current, up-to-date information? We create a knowledge base that can be constantly updated by the team and even by the wider group of the organization contributing to it. And in the future, ideally, some of that may be updated by the customer as well. So we're talking about technology that can allow that to happen as well as keep it secure. So at any time, any point in time, knowledge represents, this knowledge base represents the best understanding of what we have collectively learned to date. Knowledge used to support is considered part of a key aspect of IT. And I've been working in the IT realm for quite some time. My focus here is on how do we make knowledge a considerable component of the support process. And when we're talking about support, we're talking about the entire level, all, all levels, including the service to the customer in a FAQ or a listed area where they can find information. That might be a user portal, we call it sometimes a website FAQ. It is the place people go to access information that will help them solve a problem or get information and answer a question. So the considerations around creating a knowledge base that can be used to support include how do we create business as usual processes in order to engage people proactively in updating the knowledge base on a regular basis? How do we make sure that it is used by customers? Well, we need to write it for their use. So how do we ensure that our teams are writing knowledge that is useful and readable and understandable by the customer? Also, how do we make sure that we have a single source? Articles must link to each other. In order to do that, we need to make sure that when something breaks in a list or in a long um, IT article we might have, we want to make sure that if there is a different link that we're linking to in that list, that if it breaks, it's not going to break anything else. So we'll talk a little bit about how articles are designed or knowledge is designed 
to eliminate the possibility of failure when someone is searching and finding. Also, in challenges, we have to understand what, what we can do and can't do with existing knowledge bases. How do we control and manage knowledge or articles that are in a knowledge base to ensure that they are secure and that they are used by the right teams? And how do we train any new practices for engaging people, particularly people who are not uh, highly trained in a specific area, uh, particularly around IT, for instance? And also, do we want to make sure that we have the why in this? Yes, we want to make sure that everyone understands why we're doing it. And that was mentioned by others in the uh, other presenters. It's so important to know why we're doing this, and that has to be part of our Im involvement. So across the organization, there are several ways of centralizing knowledge bases. One of them is to create a self-serve portal for us to serve customers, and that could be an internet or it could be an intranet, where people who are in the organization can access knowledge. We also may have SharePoint libraries, for instance, and that's a very popular way of storing documentation for people to refer to. We may have wikis. We may have access to documents that are in our back drawer. We may have a spreadsheet on our page that gives us access to a list of questions we commonly get. We might have policies and user guides located in various uh, storage areas on a drive. Um, we also may have user stories that are part of a service delivery process when a new product or application is being developed. As those are released into the um, environment, they may be very useful to agents and analysts in solving a problem so that they know and under understand whether the current state of that product or new release is actually part of a user story and is now released. So there are a lot of different ways of sharing knowledge, but we want them to be accessible to everyone. We want to have a central knowledge base area where we can either point to the libraries or access the intranet and make sure that we don't have duplicates. Duplicates can cause a lot of effort. We want to reduce the effort in managing the knowledge base. So how you design the knowledge base is going to make a big difference in whether or not you have duplication. Also, now that we have a wider understanding of knowledge and how it can impact us in the IT world with regard to centralization, access, speed of access, other parts of the organization are starting to show an interest in this finance, human resources, library services, and other departments are asking IT or looking to others in the organization to help with centralizing their knowledge base and isolating it and securing it so that it is protected, but also so that everyone can share to it and we know that we have the latest knowledge available. So with KCS Knowledge Centered Service, there is a methodology to assist with all of this. There are, there are two loops to the methodology. They're commonly called the KCS Evolve and the KCS Solve loops. Those loops give us a structured approach to creating and managing knowledge in the workflow, as well as all of the leadership engagement aspects, including how do we keep our content healthy or uh, manage our content so it's up to date. What kind of processes do we need to integrate in order to ensure that we keep our day-to-day -day activities working smoothly? And also the technology, as well as the performance assessment work. And that was ex exceptionally good, Jeff, when you described how things could be measured with a balanced scorecard. I agree with you totally. Everything uh, is interlinked and performance assessment is a very important aspect of how you manage your knowledge base. So once you start looking at KCS, Knowledge Centered Service, leadership and communication is going to be absolutely critical. One of the key focuses for us is to ensure that we start off with a great strategy, understanding how we're going to implement and adopt this methodology, and leadership needs to be engaged right from the start. Part of this would include ensuring we have a communication plan so that when we do start talking about metrics or measures, those metrics or measures are communicated correctly. 
so that people understand what we're aiming for and why we're doing it, rather than simply saying, we want to create this many knowledge articles per month, we don't want to go that way. We want to say, we want the teams to identify what their goals and objectives are, and then they decide where they will put their effort in order to achieve that. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So with the KCS Solve pra Practices, we have capture, structure, reuse, and review. Those are structures that can be added to your current workday processes in the service desk. And they are structured so that they will be part of their everyday planning and use of the knowledge base. Ideally, what we want to do is capture the requester's context in a knowledge article. So in a service desk environment, when talking to the customer, we would ad adequately add information to a knowledge article that describes in the customer's terms what the problem is. It means that we would record that either in the ticket and then copy it over to a knowledge base article, or indirectly, we would immediately start capturing that information in different ways into a area that can be copied into a knowledge base or start working directly into a knowledge article. So while talking to the customer, we wanna capture their voice. How are they describing the problem? Otherwise, later on, when they're searching, they may not find the answer easily because we haven't captured their own words as metadata in structuring that article. We want to use their terms in order to make it easier for them to find the article later when they're searching, if it does actually, uh, if that is actually shared up to a service portal or an intranet. We also want to use simple templates and make it easy for everyone on the service desk to share their uh, knowledge as they are creating the solve process or answering the question to a simple question as answering a simple question. We also want to make sure that the content of a knowledge article is not so long that and laborious that we can't find the simple quick answer. So our structure has to be simple. It has to be using a template that is easy for everyone to access, easy for everyone to add to, and then also easy for everyone to review. The review process, which is down at the bottom, is to do with how we look at knowledge articles when we open them. Ideally, what we want to do is update them and make sure that we fix any changes to them in the process of review when we open the article. So that we don't have thousands of articles to review at the end of the year, we look at the articles as we open them and identify where there is a need to fix or if we can, fix it ourselves. There is a license to modify capability within the methodology that can be set up, usually using a tool inside your service management tool to allow people to access knowledge base activity information and store and retrieve that information as well as edit it. So those licenses we'll be talking about later. The reuse factor is really important. How do we know whether someone's using the article whether it's being used in the service area for the customer or whether it's being used by our teams. And how often is it being used? That can often lead to an understanding of issues such as where we may have product updates that need to be implement, implemented to save time and reduce the number of calls coming in. So in the KCS process, we have roles. The roles allow us to identify who is now currently creating a draft, who is editing a draft of an article that we're writing, and also how do we help each other through a technical level of expertise. Perhaps we have a knowledge domain expert who knows quite a bit about the topic and wants to contribute. Those roles are identified as we gradually move through the process of adoption. Some people will have an interest and a need to publish for their area because they want to have greater high, higher level reserved information or um, review of information at a high level. And they may need to understand the customer's words better. Those publishers who are adding information to the user portal may be the last reviewer of a knowledge article and may have the right to copy that article up to a user portal or an internet. 
we may also have customers contributing. So our definition here of contributor, knowledge domain expert, candidate, and publisher is quite structured. We can see who's doing what, who has access to the article, who can change the article and publish it, who can review the article, and who can add information and update articles. The candidate in the center is the person who's going to be starting off with a knowledge idea. They may say, I think there's a great opportunity for a knowledge article. I'm going to add it to the knowledge base. So everyone in the organization effectively is a candidate. They can add new knowledge articles and they can review all their own articles as well as flag, which means add for change, or use. So if they want to use that knowledge article when solving a problem, they can do so. A coach is a really com critical component to the KCS process. And most of the coaching that we're talking about similar to what Kat was talking about in her presentation on mentoring versus coach, the coach role is instrumental in ensuring the performance of the individuals who are working in KCS is at top notch. So the coach is there to assist, help, and ensure that anyone who has problems or needs assistance in getting started with the KCS Knowledge Center service process has everything on tap. Also, so that they understand the why. Why are we doing this? And how is it benefiting the customer and our team and the organization? Those are the key roles that we talk about when we're looking at KCS. Ideally, every organization will have team goals involved in all aspects of service. But we're looking here at, ideally, a scenario where a team who's working at a service desk identifies their own team goal for knowledge. For instance, in this case, the outcome might be we would like to have fewer repeat calls coming in on a particular topic area. We know that we're getting a lot of calls coming in. Let's see how we can reduce repeat calls. So we start with a strategy on how we look to develop and understand what knowledge could benefit us by either adding new knowledge to the customer portal, adding new knowledge to our own service desk area or other parts of the service process. To get fewer repeat calls, ideally, we want to have knowledge articles that are available to the customer so that they will find them and we will not call again as they have found and self-served. Self so ideally, we want to put a structure in place that allows everyone who's in the team to add knowledge when they need to that will allow them to serve that information up to the customer on those repeat calls. We also want to ensure we have limited um, information that is clearly defined for self-serve. The content has to be designed correctly and understood well by the customer. So part of the KCS process, of course, I mentioned earlier, is to ensure that the customer words are used when you capture the query or the request in your knowledge article. That way you have content in the user portal that is relevant to the customer when they go to search, making search easier and making the answer easier to understand. So the delivery aspect is we have to make sure we have processes that allow for greater information or better information to be available to the customer. And as a result of that, our outcome will be fewer repeat calls. Part of the KCS assessment process might be to look at how of each of these uh, solve processes are assisting us in improving across the service desk environment. I've just put some sample measures up here. So for instance, how much do we do in terms of our capture? When we're looking at our processes, are we actually capturing the customer information in the context of the customer while we're handling the call? We also need to look at whether or not that is relevant to the customer. And you can test whether or not it is used as well. When you test the use, you're looking at whether or not the search works. Actually, this is a very as important aspect of creating knowledge, is testing in the user environment to determine whether or not it is easily found and also understandable. The structure around knowledge, ideally, we want to ensure that the knowledge we use is easy to read 
easy to find, but also is useful. So our mo most important focus is that we're creating knowledge that will be used and is useful by doing a little bit of analysis on what kinds of calls are coming in, and sometimes the knowledge domain expert will do this, we will then identify an opportunity to create a knowledge article. So it's not exactly always based on what the customer is asking for, it may be some analysis that allows us to understand whether or not we have gaps in knowledge and then providing those. Looking at reuse, we might say, how often do we actually reuse this article? And if we're using it a lot, are we making sure that we identify opportunities to add new knowledge articles that will reduce the need for that article to be used? In other words, let's reduce the calls. So reducing the calls might mean updating and improving our products. Knowledge can be used very much towards the design of products to reduce the number of incidents that might come in, and in the long term also to do root cause analysis. So in the reuse factor, knowing that we've seen articles being reused by the service desk as part of the normal everyday process, we can begin to analyze how that reuse indicates to us that we have a problem somewhere we need to analyze further. Also, improve. We want to make sure that over a period of time, all the licensing and permissions that we have are giving people an opportunity to review and improve the knowledge articles that exist. Ideally, if people have that opportunity and are able to see each other's uh, changes to a knowledge article or any feedback that's been requested on a knowledge article, people will engage more with the knowledge. They will look to see what the current knowledge state is. And in fact, the consortium has identified that many customers do not want to see absolutely perfect knowledge. They'd rather see the current state of knowledge. As long as you let them know that this is not the perfect final article or this is not the final um, state of the resolve or the state of the answer, they will be satisfied and they will be happier having that access to the current state. So we're talking about metrics that are very valuable in terms of continuous improvement processes alongside other aspects of the balanced scorecard and the service desk metrics we're talking, which were mentioned earlier by Jeff Rumberg. All right, so the benefits of a central knowledge base reduced time is really important because ideally we're going to find things quickly. We're going to be able to hand, handle the uh, call more quickly and answer the call. We're also going to find more quickly. We're also going to find an improved service process overall, with, which will give us greater satisfaction from the customer and our staff are going to be more um, satisfied with their process, confident with their process, and able to ensure ultimately that their customer is getting the most up-to-date information. And as they do that, they begin to realize how important it is to contribute to that knowledge base. So the knowledge updated through use ensures everyone participates. As they begin to participate, they learn quickly that other people are seeing what they're adding and they see that it is beneficial to others, especially the customer. That can be sometimes a very enhancing aspect of the role that they're playing and highly regarded by managers because ultimately what we're aiming for is customer uh, satisfaction and better experience in engaging. So our team resiliency is going to be part of our process for KCS or knowledge centered service activity. The team resiliency is really recorded by how often are we using knowledge? Are we actually being resilient? Are we updating knowledge based on our current understanding of what is currently true? And giving people a challenge to do so. So given accountability and responsibility for knowledge creation, teams will proactively share knowledge. Sorry, I read that slide, but I couldn't help myself. So part of our process around this is looking at how we handle knowledge. I'm going to talk a little bit about intelligent swarming here because in the self-service environment, very often the customer is looking to find information and they're looking now at a knowledge base. If we have a central knowledge base that we're serving to them, 
we also are looking at ourselves. In the service desk environment, very often we're forwarding on to another group. Intelligence swarming would allow us to bring other people into this environment more quickly, where the knowledge base is being used to assist the self-serve, it's also being used quickly to assist all the people in support. So with intelligence swarming, we may also need a second level knowledge base, which will be the profile of all of our staff who are available at any time, who could be called in on a call and allow us to swarm around the issue or swarm to ensure we have all the right people in place to handle that call more quickly. Ultimately, what we want to achieve here is faster service to the customer. If they can't find the article or the service is not provided through the self-serve, they will go to assisted. And in the future, assisted will look different. Assisted may have greater collaboration where we move from a tiered escalation model to a collaboration model. And that may be allowing us to quickly bring people into calls and hand that over to the person who is taking the call, who then owns it. Also, we then bring in other groups, perhaps development and engineering and product management may be part of that work. Ultimately, communities and social media and insights on how they're using our knowledge base could also contribute to the central knowledge base and single source of truth. So here we are looking at how do we move to this? We have to look at the teams and the groups that are working with the customer all the way out into our organization and across our organization to understand that support is a network. Ideally, we want to make this possible by using tools uh, some new tools may be available to help with that. There are some great ones out there, but it's not necessarily the only way. You may use spreadsheets even. Support as a network means that we're talking about people and how they interact. And those people are designing their own way of working to get the information to the customer as quickly as possible. We want to create a learning organization where we value the knowledge that we share and encourage people to share knowledge rather than hoard it or make it a way of um, keeping them uh, in, ensconced in their own ivory tower. We want to ensure that people are sharing that knowledge and making it viable for others to learn. So we're creating a learning organization. Ideally, we want to use Agile as a means towards that, and there are some great processes that were mentioned earlier. Uh, and I want to endorse all of those. Also, we want to work on change management from the point of view of how are we inspiring and empowering people to do this work. Those areas are really critical to engaging people all the way along and ensuring they feel empowered in making this work. So they have to understand the metrics and they have to understand how the metrics that they use are engaging the customer more proactively either through the discussions with the customer and requesting information from them to build the knowledge base, or even later in making sure that the processes in the technology are quick and allow us to search more effectively. Where you're talking about it with intelligence swarming, one of the key companies that's involved in doing this work and bringing all of the tiers together is Cisco. One of the things they've recently stated is it's so simple. You just get the right work to the right person, connect that person to other smart people, capture what they do and reuse it, and do it all in the workflow. And the way to do that, ideally, is to have people connected easily and to have knowledge available. So here's a sample of some of the things that we look at when we're talking about intelligence swarming and getting the right work to the right resource at the right time. We do have to understand that this is new, there are uh, tools out there that will assist it, but really it's ideally going to provide us with a structure around how people work together. And we don't need to go into huge investments in software to develop this. It's about process and people. All right, so the future of knowledge in human machine collaboration is 
ideally a support network is supported by a collaborative activity with a machine. And we're talking about doing that right now with chats, chat bots, and other aspects of interaction where we have support from a machine learning solution that allows us to see and understand easier ways of moving forward using digital technologies and supplying support to the customer. So where we have repeat calls, where we have information that's available, readily available uh, up in the portal that reduce repeat calls, we make use of it. Where we may have a chat bot that asks, allows a customer to ask a simple question and get a simple answer to reduce the repeat calls coming in, we use it. So ideally, we want to think about these tools, these uh, machine, human machine collaboration in a way that is really positive, that gives us a better understanding of what customers need, and also to keep all of that repeat work off our desks so that we can focus on the work that's really important. So this kind of eff effort is not going to be negative. It's going to be positive for us in the end. And most people do get it once they understand that the human machine interaction provides us to create better understanding of the customer and generate better information for the customer. We also want to make sure that we have a better understanding of how people are using devices. And that can be coming through on knowledge. So where we actually see what they're searching for, how they're using knowledge, how often are they looking for information, especially in the sales side, but also in the service side, that insight will help us to develop better interaction with the customer through self-serve by giving them a knowledge that is going to make sense and giving them knowledge that's relevant to them at the time that they need it. Predictive analysis. And that's one of the other things that the Consortium for Service Innovation is engaging on now. So ultimately, what we want to see is support as a network, providing all the information that is needed to the customer as well as a quick response where they have an urgent need by swarming. We can allow all of the customer needs to be met more quickly through either knowledge or defined through a interaction with their device in a collective environment where they can even share and they can provide requests for new knowledge to be available to them. So it all is engaging the customer in a very positive way and ensuring that they have what they need at the time that they need it. Okay, here I am. It's now, I think, time for us to finish the presentation and take questions. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Beth. That was um, a really, really interesting presentation to, to listen to with um, so many practical things that people can really do. So that's fantastic. Um, so a question that has that is here, I've got here, is um, what would you say some of the biggest challenges are uh, to KCS adoption? Uh, one of the key challenges for KCS adoption is the need to understand what is going to be engaging people in the new work process. It is a new way of thinking and a new way of working. So uh, there needs to be an understanding by top management, and very often that means a communication plan and a strategy. Once that is completed and rolling out to the teams who are using this, there needs to be considerable understanding of any issues that come up, any questions they have, and any um, negative aspects of their response to using this new process so that they can be responded to and so that people can get a better understanding of the why. So I think the challenge for a lot of people is it does take time. You do need to think about what this change means for people. And you need to be considerate of the history we have in the world of service that has been um, written for us, very much so, in a way that um, enables us to work in tiers, enables us to forward calls on. And think about how does knowledge support that? And then secondly, how do we actually want to look in the future? And the way we want to look might be more agile, it should certainly seems to be the way everyone's looking and might use human machine interaction to save us time. And, and we need to plan that. So the challenge is taking the time out, thinking about it, engaging teams in it, and ensuring they're part of it. 
That's the challenge. Bring people from all aspects of the process into the design. That is really critical. Mm, absolutely. And, and this um, question that's come in from a listener is very much along the same sort of lines. Um, I'll put it to you. You might have another another um, couple of points to add. But she's asked, um, many organizations are very lean today. How do we encourage the change to collaborative support versus escalation? Well, lean is a benefit to KCS is, is very much focused around. Let's make sure we have the right information by for use by the right group. Uh, so the shift left concept that we talked about earlier certainly aligns very well with lean. Where organizations are reducing the tier structure or removing service levels, even in some cases removing service desks, the idea around challenge, challenging information to be made available to everyone as quickly as possible and, and asking people to share is the ideal scenario. So within the lean environment, Everyone needs to understand how knowledge can help them to reduce time, reduce costs, and make sure that everyone has the right information. Part of that is we need to be able to have information available quickly. So analysis of the search, where are people looking? How are people wasting time in search is a really critical aspect of the analysis you do in knowledge management and Overall, with KCS and using KCS processes, you are going to become leaner. You're going to find the knowledge you need more quickly, and you're going to reduce the cost associated with that search. Yeah, okay. So uh, would you say that doing some of that analysis on kind of the gaps maybe or on what you've got already, is that a good place to start? So if people are looking at, you know, what's, what's the very first step they could take? Yes. Um, so many organizations will have knowledge that is sitting in archives and may or may not be used. The scenarios that come across us in the service desk environment, there may be old knowledge bases that have been um, written in the past that are still possibly useful. And what we agree, uh, what we've agreed on for the most part in most organizations is let's look at what knowledge is being used now. Let's identify how often is it being used and where is it being used and whether or not we want to archive it or keep it in our knowledge base. Ideally, we don't want a lot of old knowledge in the knowledge base. We want to reduce the knowledge that's um, getting into the knowledge base in the search and making it harder for us to find the answers we need quickly. Um, so archiving is the way. And very often, you may need to look back in the archive because if you've been adding knowledge to your ticket as part of your everyday work process, you want to be able to do a trend analysis on how often have those knowledge articles been used in the past as well to give you an understanding of where we were maybe two years ago with a certain type of question or a certain type of information that was requested by customers. So archiving is the way, but understanding how to structure that and making sure it's available to people um, as a second level is very useful and helpful. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I think that's probably all of the um, listeners' questions that we've got time for today. Um, okay. But thanks so much, Beth, for sharing that um, presentation with us. Oh, it's um, very exciting you... to be here, Zoe. Zoe. I thank you very much for all your patience, too. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. And um, as Beth says, you know, we've got we still have got three more presentations coming up. So do stay with us for those if you can. Um, Beth's details are on that slide. there, still showing. I'll leave that on there for a few more moments. And um, if you'd like to get in touch, um, Beth, I'm sure you'd be happy to hear from people. Yes, please do give me a call or I do uh, collaborate remotely. If you're interested in anything to do with KCS, I'm very happy to answer any questions you have.